Welcome, everyone, to What the Force. And before we get into the exciting episode with Maggie Novakowska about our fandom beginnings and all based from her own experience and her story that she's going to share with us, I wanted to just take a moment to talk about a few exciting things that have happened. First, this episode is entirely sponsored by Hank Green. With the release of his new book, the follow-up to An Absolutely Remarkable Thing, the new book, A Beautiful Foolish Endeavor, is out for sale tomorrow. And with that, I would like to read the word from our sponsor. Hank Green's first book, An Absolutely Remarkable Thing, was released in 2018. The story of a young woman thrown into and then growing her fame as the world suddenly deals with massive changes in the form of contagious dreams and mysterious 10-foot tall robots that have appeared in every major city. Associate Press said it was a thrilling journey that takes a hard look at the power of fame and our willingness to separate a person from the brand. Book reported said, perhaps as honest a look as we will ever get at the phenomenon of cyber fame. And San Francisco Chronicle said, sparkling with mystery, humor, and the uncanny. This is a fun read, but beneath the effervescent tone, more complex themes are at play. Well, now that novel is out in paperback or at your library and also for cheap in audio form. The sequel and conclusion of the story, A Beautiful Foolish Endeavor, is out to sparkling reviews. Hank wanted his publisher to sponsor a ton of up-and-coming podcasts, and they said that was too weird. So instead, Hank took 5% of his advance from the book and did it himself. Library Journal's starred review said, Throughout this adventurous, witty, and compelling novel, Green delivers sharp social commentary on the power of social media and both the benefits and horrendous consequences that follow when we give too much of ourselves to technology. The book is out July 7th in physical, audio, and ebook wherever books are sold, or you can just go to hankgreen.com and that will get you where you need to go. We'd like to thank Hank Green for uh, willing to take a chance on What the Force, so thank you so much. As to the rest of our news, we're going to be experiencing some pretty exciting changes up and coming to do with content and what we will be offering from What the Force. I'm really excited about it, so make sure to pay attention to announcements and anything from Twitter slash Facebook uh, will, of course, let everybody know as soon as we have that all locked in as far as when things will be happening. On July 18th, we'll be doing a live stream conversation with Rihanna B. She's well known on Twitter as a cosplayer. She cosplays as Ray and I think it'll be a lot of fun just to do a chat and Q&A all about what she's got going on. In the liner notes of this episode, there'll also be a request to call for Q&A questions, so feel free to submit. And I look forward to seeing you all there. Now, on to the episode. And welcome to a new episode where we are sort of tracing back our roots a little bit, and we are going to be speaking with Maggie Novakowska. <laughs> welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And to join me in this discussion, because it's actually kind of based in some of the topics that I've previously had on the show, I have Susan Bailey back. Welcome, Susan. Hi, I'm so excited to be back. Hi, Susan. <laughs> Hi, Maggie. <laughs> this is such a fun thing, because during the Looking for Leia documentary, um, we got a really amazing look back at our roots as almost a fandom, especially from, you know, a female perspective that, you know, we've always been here. <laughs> and and especially mm -hmm. episode two, which you played prominently in from like the the history of fanzines and where where were the women when they said no women were Star Wars fans, basically. <laughs> I really don't know what the universe they were living in when they said that. Well, you know, maybe they just weren't the ones that maybe they were looking for women in the toy store or in, you know, uh, different locations. Well, you know, I, it's all I think the web made a big difference. 
Mm -hmm. because a lot more people talk to each other. We communicate with each other by mail. Mm -hmm. Or if we belong to a local science fiction club, we got to know people that way. But as far as Star Trek fandom, which is where Star Wars fandom grew out of, zine fandom, Mm -hmm. it was a matter of either you met each other locally or you read Star Trek Lives and you saw that there were fanzines in existence. Mm-hmm. And you wrote to the addresses you saw in the back of the paperback. Mm-hmm. And you made contact that way. I have boxes of letters that I've kept from my friends that I've made over fandom. And we would write 10 pages worth of letters, single space type, both sides. And we talked that way. We talked to the zine editors that way. Slowly, you would get phone numbers and you talk to somebody by phone, but long distance was expensive. Mm-hmm. So you didn't do that that much because we didn't have any money. Um, and then there was an annual fan convention. We're not talking about a convention with guests, except mm-hmm. us. We were each other's guests at the fan. We went there to talk about stories to talk about the fandom we were involved with, and to talk to each other. We spent four days basically talking to each other and going to the dealer's room of the zines we were making or the necklaces we were making. Things changed a lot when Creation Con and the conventions became more popular, more general. Mm -hmm. And then the net came in, and we had a Star Wars fan letter zine that moved to the web and we talked to each other that way by writing email messages back and forth this was a lot faster than in the old days because in the old days you wrote letters into an editor who did a a fanzine of letters and you waited anywhere from four weeks to 12 weeks to get to read what people wrote back into there and to get an answer back Mm -hmm. and we were accustomed to it. The immediacy of the web changed things a great deal. Most of the fancy people were women. Mm-hmm. They had been in Star Trek fandom. And when Star Wars came out, I had printed, I had published two things in Star Trek zines. A story called Dragoneers about Spock climbing the mountain and meeting a dragon. Mm-hmm. And then my TV history of um, time between 1960 and when Kirk and Spock were there. So I knew some people and I called up one woman and I said, do you know anybody who's making a Star Wars fanzine? And she said, I think my friend Bev is. And so write to her. And I wrote to Bev. She was doing a fanzine. This was the summer, fall of 77. And her fanzine came out in April of 78, which was really the first serious all-fiction Star Wars fanzine. And it was the fanzine that Gary Kurtz took to 20th Century Fox to demonstrate to them that this was not going to break their bottom line, (laughs) that women were doing this. Oh, can you tell me a little bit more about that? I have no idea what that is. I've never heard about that before. Well, no, because Bev is the one who called me up and said, hey, guess what I just heard from from Lucasfilms. Uh, Bev has left us now. She died about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm hoping to be able to go through all her files because her husband said she saved everything Mm -hmm. and to get the paperwork behind this to get the letters because she would call me up and from California where she knew a lot of people and say, okay, this just happened or this just happened. And they called me. I have found two references where she has wrote letters to letter, letter columns and said, this is what just happened. So I have her first, her first report of what happened. But you're just waiting for the behind the scenes documentation. Yes, the kind of documentation that I can uh, put in a file and make copies of and send to somebody. But we, we, we interacted an awful lot with the people in those days. Um, Star Wars was very popular, but the fanishness of Star Wars was still small. Mm-hmm. 
I had lunch lunch with Larry Kasdan when Lawrence Kasdan was still Larry Kasdan, <laughs> when Sidney Giannis was Sid, um, with the people who did Dark Star, who played the lieutenant, they would come to conventions. And they come up to our regional conventions and they do a panel. And then we'd sit around afterwards, this all being in the late 70s, early 80s. I can remember before Jedi came out, sitting in a room with Markland, the director. And he says, okay, everybody, who knows what the name of the emperor is? And most of the people didn't. I raised my hand and said, Palpatine. And he said, yes. And we went on from there. It was that casual. Mm -hmm. In 79, we went to Brighton, England, to the Science Fiction World Convention. And, and Lucasfilms had a display. And we Star Wars fans helped them put it up. And we helped them tear it down at the end of the convention. Because we had been talking. Lots of the fans and editors talked to Craig Miller, who was a fan liaison at that time. Mm -hmm. And eventually got to know Mary Garrett who was the family uh, fan club person in the mid 80s. It was it was easier to get across because fandom had not become why well, I hesitate to use the word mundane, but it had become the whole world. Yeah. And especially especially once the web came out, it was much more intimate in, in, in those days. I always thought that, like, especially you know, the start of celebration in the in the 90s, there was always a pre-existing connection to the fans, like with Lucasfilm, like there was always kind of a grassroots, you know, the fans were there and it was kind of just this give and take relationship. They ignored you from a story creation perspective for the most part, but it, like there's always been a very close relationship with the fans. And, and that's no, where there was. Like now we're getting to the point with like the Disney acquisition where you know, in many ways, I think that they needed to take a step back because there's like this assumption for people who have been in the fandom for so long that they have this easy access and it's almost built into the, you know, sub communication of the fandom, which maybe shouldn't have been that way as they as Star Wars got bigger. I will agree with you on that because there are some things that. I can remember talking with people and suddenly a silence would fall and we would both realize that perhaps we had gotten into territory yeah. that we shouldn't be talking about with each other. But uh, but Lucasfilms collected fanzines. It had a fanzine library. And when they made a big move in the late 80s, Maureen called me and said, look, we're getting rid of duplicates. We're getting rid of the fanzines that were never taken out of the library. Mm -hmm. I've got about 10 boxes of fanzines. Do you want them? And I said, sure, send them up. And they all showed up on my doorstep one day. And we put together a lending library because by 86, 87, you couldn't get the, the original fanzines. They weren't being printed anymore. People got jobs. They got married. They moved on. They, they weren't doing it. And so we would... We cataloged all the fanzines. We set up a, we told people to send us SAAEs. And for the cost of postage, we would send a fanzine out to them and they would send it back to us when they were done. That eventually moved on to a woman in California who was retired and had lots of time in storage area. And she created what she called the Corellian archives. And that ran into the web period and it expanded to include all the different kinds of fandoms that were around by then what we used to call fringe fandoms back in the day, Star Trek days and when she when she passed on she donated all those fan scenes to the Iowa, Iowa archive libraries in um, University of Iowa names and oh. they now have a whole collection Graduate students go there to study it, and we're slowly feeding them letters and production flats because nobody knows how we made those zines. Right? They, you know, people don't know what a mimeo is anymore. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> it was a giant machine that sat on your dining room table that looked like a big drum, mm -hmm. and you typed 
Easter and you ran it through the drum and it looked blue on paper and it was it it went was done on paper that was very fragile some of those old zines now you have to be very careful when you look at them because the paper's about to fall apart that's what most of the early star trek scenes were all on mimeo i actually know that some zines were done like heat transfer um the old little experiments you now see in kids science books and science magazines hey kids mm-hmm. try this you can just write a letter and transfer it onto another piece of paper um and that was the zines were like and when bev started doing star wars zines she she went through a printer but lots of people copied them they did photocopies mm-hmm. and back then you much heavier photocopy paper. Um, yeah. Photocopy paper was, we were still having some that had a clay coating on it yeah. back in those days. And uh, the early, I saw it in Star Wars fanzines. You could see us from the very beginning where you had um, fo- early photocopy, some Mimeo, and how it slowly moved through offset printing and then eventually ended up with something called PageMaker. Because before the computers became popular, everything was typed out on a typewriter. I wrote a thousand manuscript page novel. Bev had to type the damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> and when I sent her a correction, she had to retype it. And then she once she got a piece of paper that had all the type on it the way she wanted it, and it was usually an oversized piece of paper, on her kitchen counter, she pasted it onto the format paper that she took to the printer, who then reduced the type to eight and a half by 11. And then because nobody page, wanted- page maker was like when computers came around and was part of like WordPerfect, yeah. I think? Uh, it was after WordPerfect. Okay, okay. WordPerfect, so- WordPerfect helped people an awful lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I... It's like getting your first IBM Selectric computer. I remember when I got, I'm a typewriter, not computer. I remember when I got my Selectric, and I could actually put the correction tape in there and erase the letters. I didn't have to retype every page. It saved writers so much time. <laughs> it saved a lot of time. It um, You were much more intimate with your story. Mm-hmm. It... Um, and the really thing that's big is I, I post, I have some stuff posted on AO3 and I write on computers drop, now. Drop your, drop your username. <laughs> Maggie dot, Maggie dot, Maggie dot Very straightforward. <laughs> We're going to um, link to everybody. Go right out. <laughs> Maggie, I have a couple of questions for you. Yeah. Um, did you, you talked about meeting friends through the, like through zines, but did you have any like real life in person Star Wars friends that you would talk oh, to? Yeah. And um, like when you went to the conventions, what was the the demographics like in terms of like age, gender? Um, okay, the science fiction con- conventions I went to, which is where the guests did show up as far as the uh, makers and cast, and those were your standard science fiction convention mix, which is sixty forty. Mm -hmm. Uh, male female Mm -hmm. there were always women i've read science fiction since i was six years old and got space cat on venus out of the library (laughs) and um, many of my the star trek fans who started out belonged to the lunacon people in new york city and that was mixed male female media west con which was the con that ran nearly 40 years Mm -hmm. was primarily female we always had some guys there we always had a mix of women but in many ways it was a very different um draw of people very recently i read somebody saying i think it was on on uh what the uh, force where a woman was saying that she felt kind of isolated in some ways from some of her other fans because she was jewish Mm. The women of the wills that you listen to. Yeah. I discovered both of you at the same time, so I'm still confusing it. That's okay. I love I, told I you, love the women of the wills. They're friends they're of the friends. podcast. <laughs> friends of the podcast. Yes, yes. Many of them have been Absolutely. on. <laughs> well, I was looking to your list. I haven't made it all the way through the list of everything I want to listen to. But the population 
in the 70s and into the early 80s of women in their 20s and early 30s, we were coming out of a culture that was so different from what it is now. Um, I knew friends who never drove a car because their father didn't believe women should drive cars. I knew fans who had never had a checkbook. And it, there was, it, it's hard to imagine now. And the fandom was full of people of Jewish background, Catholic background, um, people who grew up in ethnic communities. And these are all what we would now consider white girls. Mm -hmm. I grew up calling people Anglos because I grew up in a Polish neighborhood and we weren't Anglos. And the, this mm -hmm. woman said in this one letter, she grew up in an ethnic neighborhood, but it was white ethnic. And fandom was heavily that way. I, I told a couple of friends this and they just laughed. One woman I know who was Baptist, she says, I felt really out of place at times. So when we're talking about the 40, 50 years in fandom, it's almost like going to another country, mm -hmm. and, you know, a stranger in a strange land. I have to adapt to people who have grown up with my science fiction world. We watched Star Trek and said, wow, wouldn't it be great to have a communicator and to be able to call your friends wherever they were? Yeah. And now we all have cell phones. And, <laughs> and we can't escape them. <laughs> and you got it. Right? Yeah. Wait a minute. We didn't know these are unexpected consequences right. mm -hmm. of having a communicator in your pocket. So um, the, the, the Zeke Media fanzine world was primarily female, mm -hmm. heavily female. A lot of us in the early days were heavily science fiction fans. So when Star Wars fan fiction started, a lot of us were treating it like a science fiction universe. Mm -hmm. We were creating a yep. story. We were future for the story and um, one of the earliest contrasts that I remember coming into are the people who wrote relationship stories oh mm. shock I, <laughs> yeah call it slash that's another subject to handle a little bit later <laughs> because Star Wars was a little different than Star Trek slash yes it was coming out very strong right. in the late 70s in Star Trek fandom. The history of fandom is is so rich that it's something you could talk about for hours. Almost like I have I, I know somebody who's trying to put get together geek elders. That's how we handle it. And we used to call ourselves dinosaurs. Now we call ourselves you know, geek elders. I love that to name. get some that's good. First person essays, first people talking about what their background was. And mm -hmm. we've ended up dividing it into 67 to 83 or 77 to 85, depending on which zingdom you're talking about, because the eras are very, very different mm. because of the way fandom is changing. I was looking through some old, old Star Trek letter zines, and I found some of the first letters that started coming in when Slash became known to more people. And the mm -hmm. very first letter, K, okay, not my thing, but hey, no worry about it. And that was a couple of different issues. And then, bang, we hit the next issue and we got the, what do you think people think you're doing? <laughs> this is horrible. This is terrible. And so just like now, really. Yeah. Yes. Yes, very much. And I was surprised when I got into online fan fiction fandom because it's all relationship now it seems yeah at a couple of panels i've been to at conventions in our our regional science fiction con we would have panels on fan fiction and i you know go to it and i'd be excited and finally about halfway through i'd raise my hand and say is anybody writing about the universe mm -hmm. and talking about history and background and politics and no at that particular panel that I asked that at, one of the women said, you need to start your own panel on that. Oh. Because it was heavily relationships. I had no problems. I, I write relationships in my stories. They're not the prime focus unless I'm really doing a character study. And uh, that was one of the big shifts, even as I saw in fandom. Those first three years 
between 77 and 80. Mm-hmm. The universe was ours. We filled in background. We went, filled in futures. We knew nothing about, I'm your father. <laughs> we knew nothing about Leia and Han, except for those people who wrote those kind of stories. Uh, so um, our stories became instant headcanon. In May of 1980, <laughs> called it alternative universes. Right. Yeah. So, do you think that, like, because the universe has been so filled in, at least, at least for Star Wars particularly, that there isn't as much space to kind of play in create in mm-hmm. universe creation, creating the structure and the politics, and I mean, anybody could go in. And now, and I know that a lot of people still, especially from an RPG perspective, if you're a DM, you're maybe creating your own world or your own, you know, syndicate or your own group or your own sub Jedi, or you're going way back in the past or way in the future so that you can play a little bit more with the universe creation and doing that. But in fan stories, particularly, there isn't as much play if you're in you're trying to do canon compliant or in universe very true very true i do have, the stories i have on ao3 i think are still canon compliant it's been a couple of years uh but they're about lando and mon mothma uh, how did how did lando get talked into be um involved and become general Coruscant? oh cool I mean, that See, that's trick. still a good question <laughs> Yes, yes. And so my story, my big story in there is uh, exactly how that happens. First, the guys try to get him in and he says, no, thank you. (laughs) Not really. And then Momofma tries to get him in. But because we didn't yet have anything on Momofma and how she handled the the rebellion, Mm -hmm. I wrote my own Mothma. Now we have a little bit more on her. And so that story has become alternate as far as Mon Mothma is concerned. Mm-hmm. And it depends on how, I guess, how much somebody wants to play with the universe. And I think we've all seen, especially on Twitter, how many people do not want to play with the universe? No. And we're getting now into scripture. Yeah. Because basically, mm-hmm. that's where you go when people start saying it has to be this way. Yeah. You cannot change it. Nowadays, I'm starting to tell people that I'm a Gnostic writer. <laughs> that's, that's smart. But then you have to explain that to people who haven't had any church history in their in their background. So Matt Martin has has gotten into, in some ways, some fandom drama because he has stated, like, canon really shouldn't matter to people. People make a big deal out of it. And, and like me, I come from this... I, I would say very odd view. Um, my favorite book in canon slash like that has been produced in the Disney era is The Legends of Luke Skywalker, which is a frame story with legends of Luke, you know, and his adventures that have filtered through the galaxy and are being told word of mouth, you know, ear to ear type stories like I heard this story from X not necessarily like they even witnessed it themselves and then they're retelling it in the course of the story Um, this was done by Ken Liu it's literally my favorite story because it takes it and it says look the point of the story actually kind of doesn't matter whether it's true or not. It is what you learn from the story and what you take right. home from the story and what the people that are listening to the story matters. And like, it's such a, it's, it's almost like a, like such a rebellious way to view Star Wars nowadays, because there's so many people that are like, no, it's, it only matters if it's true to the universe. Well, what is it? You know, Absolutely. You know, and this kind of g- gets into my my question about and and discussion about, you know, fandom is both collective, right, and personal, and and we struggle with that a lot. Okay, I heard a dog bark, so I gotta mention what are your dogs' names? 
<laughs> oh my heavens, that's a good <laughs> audio system you've got because she's in the front room. We have Pomeranians. Oh, oh. Our, uh, the old fashioned Pomeranians. One is 11 pounds and the other one's 18 pounds. The way they used to be before everybody started having just the small ones. <laughs> We're very fond of them, but they are extremely interactive and vocal. <laughs> you know, the, the story itself, back to our main point, which is yes, yes. the story back, itself back is collective. And so, like, it's almost like the, the canon rules are like how we all communicate or, you know, but it almost feels like people want to win canon, you know, like it's a competition in some ways, you know, and I've always struggled with that personally. Yes, I do simply because of my background. Yeah, because I wrote for the first three years and created many, many thousands of pages uh, because I enjoy doing that. It's a lot of fun. And I worked at Gonzo overtime. And when I wasn't working overtime, I escaped into Star Wars. And I just look at it as religion now. I look at it from a religious structure. I remember my church history. I remember how things develop you. There's a wonderful book called The Five Gospels. And it took a whole bunch of people, scholars and people who knew their linguistics, and they analyzed Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Thomas as to what probably was really said in 30, you know, 30 AD. What could have been said in 30 AD what is probably what the apostles heard, and then what the editorializing of all the years afterwards, because it was, what, 300, the fourth century, mm -hmm. before anything became orthodox. Right. And it's, um, I, met, I have a friend who is a graduate professor in history, and I wrote to her this week to say, look, this is what we're going to be talking about. What do you think? We talked about how how people, the stories develop, like the Luke Skywalker legends, what is accepted as orthodox, what becomes Gnostic, what becomes just simply mm -hmm. another religion. And that's what I see happening with Star Wars fandom, because Lucas got the myth right. To go back to him talking with Joseph Campbell, who said mm -hmm. Lucas got the basic structure correct. And that's how human beings set up visual visualizations of emotional connections with a story that tells them what life is about. And Star Wars has done that for many people. I sat there that night in the theater and I said, finally, somebody has told a story that works for me, that mm. I can live in, that can give me something that I can hang my ideas on. And all these other people are hanging their ideas on, especially people who grew up as kids watching this. You guys probably mm -hmm. grew up as kids watching this on, on video yep. yeah. and then on DD. You have a totally different experience of somebody who was 28 years old <laughs> the same May that Star Wars came out. Yeah. I was born three months before A New Hope, ah. or, like, put in the theater. You, you are yeah. the ultimate Star Wars baby. I did get, like, a lot of stories from my dad, who was a massive science fiction fan, like, used to read old pulps and yes. things like that, and brought me into the world, basically, because, like, he saw it opening opening week or opening yeah. weekend and um you know i i remember hearing all about how he was like that darth vader he's really complicated why does he let people push him around <laughs> like he told me all of these thoughts and he got me into you know the philosophy behind it and we talked a lot about the music and all of that so like a lot of my passion is driven from his interest in the science fiction world but he was an adult like yeah. you know fully working and everything like that when he was into it. But I think it reminded him of being a kid and watching those pulp serials, especially like Flash Gordon and, you know, um, John Carter of Mars. Like he said, there was a lot of that in the feeling of it. And but then he said, there's a layer to it that is more complex that that 
it lends into the more mythic storytelling that Lucas was going for. So that's why it it bleeds from this science fiction land. And that's where sometimes people are like, I want things to be hard and, and fast, but Star Wars is weird and wonky <laughs> sometimes, right? I was just going to say, this is something that Marie Claire and I kind of have in common is that we kind of like have this, uh, had this really, really deep relationship with our dads. My dad went to theological school and he would, her dad was a philosopher. Yeah. My dad went to theological school. He introduced me to like Wonder Woman when I was a really small kid. And so I got really into Greek mythology because of the Wonder Woman comics, because I was interested in that world. And then when I was 11, that was 1988. That was when the Bill Moyers mm -hmm. and Joseph Campbell and the Power of Myth came on TV. And he was like, hey, Susan, there's a TV show that I think you would be really interested in because you like mythology. So my dad introduced me to that. And so I remember sitting there, you know, like, you know, like my dad was the kind of guy who like when I was in middle school, I had like a panic attack and couldn't sleep. And so he would stay up at night with me and like talk to me about different theories of evil. You know, like why do people suffer? Yeah. <laughs> like, why am I having this panic attack? Let's philosophize like late at night since I can't go to sleep. And so, so I'm sitting there at 11, like watching this and I see the first episode and he's like, talking about how, you know, it's mythic. And I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. That, that totally makes sense. Yeah, mm -hmm, I get it. Yep. <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> so like, I, I think both of us, Marie Claire and I both like sort of like connected on that level, you know, when we were children, you mm -hmm. know, or at, a, at an early age. And that's great. Yeah. I, I so, came out sorry. of 12 years of Catholic education. So we heard all about church history and who wh what was adapted from local pagan communities. And so, yeah, look at Star Wars and bingo. It, it made a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. So the whole subject was very much alive in the 50s still. And, uh, and I had sisters of St. Joseph in high school, and they were sharp women, very sharp women. And they would talk with you about the the problems of, uh, well, what, what about this? Or what about that? And we were beginning to ask, but what about girls? So why do women have to do this? Why can't they do that? And a lot of that was bubbling up in the culture, as I'm sure you know. And um, that's why, like I was saying, in the, early, in the early 70s, and even to the late 70s, there was a transition period for the women. And mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of women who felt limited in their private lives found an escape mm -hmm. in fandom and making zines. There was one woman who had to do her zines out of her car because her parents didn't get what she was doing. I knew of one young woman whose father was point blank with her. He'll never be able to be an artist because he healed that woman thing you get every month. Mm -hmm. There was one woman whose uh, husband allowed her to go to a convention once. But, you know, how was he going to feed himself if she wasn't here over the weekend? I mean, this were real yeah. stories that the, the women were going through. One woman in, the, in Ohio whose husband tried to have her committed because she insisted on doing fanzines and fan work. And fortunately, she got smart doctors who said, you seem perfectly sane to us. Can we talk to your husband? <laughs> it, it was a reality. There were, it just among the women, sensitive areas between those of us who actually had jobs outside of the house and actually had that independence, had careers, yeah. independence, and those women who didn't. And every once in a while, the stories we were interested in would clash, and some of our experiences would clash. The best example I have from my own experience, I wrote a story wherein Han Solo is having to come to terms with the fact that his life has changed. But there are still a lot of people mm -hmm. in his life in his 20s who perhaps have a word or two they would like to have with Captain Solo, and perhaps in a dark alley with their friends with 
And so I wrote a story like that. And I did my research, you know, gang warfare and <laughs> things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, Luke ended up being there and he learned a little bit about his dark side too that in that alley. And when the story was published and I got two different kinds of reactions. I got one reaction that said, oh my God, you're just doing a bloody story so you can beat up on. This is ridiculous. This is religious. <laughs> and then I got the other reaction from the folks who lived in the city saying, well, this was very well done. I had a parole officer who said to me, you know, you handled that well. You didn't go to as deep as you could. I went through all my letters one day because these differences were so strong. And I compared the letters and I looked at the addresses. And it was mostly, not all of them, but mostly people from smaller towns, from a, mm -hmm. uh, a more rural area. And then it was the urban people on the other side. The urban people said, okay, you handled that okay. The people from the smaller towns, from the more suburban areas, is where I got more of the shocked reaction. Now we're talking this the late mm -hmm. 70s. A little different. There were changes in that over time. I have a friend born in 72. So she was uh, still a child when uh, Star first Star Wars came out. She remembers Empire best. And she read. Mm, that's prime age. <laughs> Perfect. She read uh, one of my stories and she said, but, 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 but. I said, well, hey, Han, Han was a smuggler for God's sake. He knew how to shoot a gun. Right. He shot first people, right? And um, she says, but, but I don't want Han to be that kind of a guy. She grew up with drive-by shootings in her neighborhood. She, didn't, mm -hmm. she wanted Han to be a little bit milder because that was her experience. And so I understand why George did some of the things he did with his re revamps mm -hmm. on the movies because there were people like that friend who wanted Han to be a mm -hmm. bad boy, but not that bad. So there it's, mm -hmm. it's a, the whole saga covers going on 50 years now, especially when you take in George's, the age George was at when he wrote the story and where he was coming. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's got to have, different levels of people who take it differently because the world has changed so dramatically on a very emotional level, not just physical, not just tech, but on an emotional level in my adult life. Mm -hmm. So very, very much. much so. Yeah. so you get, oh, oh, I know what I wanted to bring up talking with my historian friend and talking with another friend. I said, am I misremembering? Or were, you, were we really glad that there wasn't any religion mentioned in Star Wars? And I'm talking the first movie here. And they said, no, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. we were all really glad that there was nothing injected into the story of that you could sit there and say, oh, okay, there's Christ figure, or okay, that. It, George, mm -hmm. Joseph Campbell makes a point about that when you see the first movie, there's nothing about, oh, you're all Rani or you're this person. There was no setting part of ethnicities among the people. There weren't, it was just one group of people coming together to fight a philosophy. Because people all over the world like it. Um, and, a, and a friend, an Israeli friend of somebody I know, always saw Star Wars from a religious point of view because she grew up in Israel with all the conflicts they mm -hmm. there. So for her, it, it was natural. It certainly can be spiritual because of the of the lens that it gives you to say, you know, hey, I'm, you know, George and, and Dave Filoni will talk about this lens of being selfish mm -hmm. or being selfless. Mm -hmm. And it gives you a very solid framework to view yes. yourself through the actions of Star Wars. And so I think it can be spiritual. It's just not an organized yes. religion. It's a very personal, you know, view set to to say, well, I'm the only one that is experiencing this and this is unique to me. 
Yeah, well, every Star Wars is unique to every person who sees it. Mm-hmm. Because people have, you know, especially when you're a kid and playing toy with your toys and everything, you're making up your own world. So you have a Han Solo, I have a Han Solo. Everybody's got their own Luke Skywalker. Um, there is George Lucas's version and Disney's version of George Lucas's version, but there's your version, there's my version, and that's where I like reading science uh, fan fiction that isn't necessarily canon. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if it gives somebody comfort, if they really like the version that they're seeing, that's okay too. Uh, think of all the people who have never seen Clone Wars, mm-hmm. who have never seen Rebels, who mm-hmm. so only have seen the movies. That's their Star Wars. Yep. And in their Star Wars, mm-hmm. there is no, uh, Anakin does not have a Padawan. You have a totally different Anakin if you watch just the movies. I have yep. sometimes a great deal of dissonance between going between Clone Wars and the movies because that's not the Anakin I saw in the movies. Right. I have a real I'm- hard time. I said, where did Anakin get a Padawan from, for heaven's <laughs> sakes? Wouldn't and that I- have changed him? I mean, I think that that's what Disney Lucasfilm now has said and and George himself, like specifically giving Anakin a Padawan even like humanized him in some ways even more from that that period of time in the history. Um, It it, it does. Um, I've always seen the Force as part of the physics of that universe. Yeah, like and you could almost view it as a very uh, in in completely science fiction terms. Like, so the force is this interconnected energy between all living things, right? And it mm-hmm. and it has its own consciousness, etc. And if you view it in a science fiction term, and you say, "Well, imagine that energy is real and gives you superpowers," what is the world like because of that? Because yes. science fiction is always based on some sort of technology or conceit and we just say it in a very scientific way well think think the force exists Mm -hmm. Uh, everybody can draw something even if it's only a stick figure if we think of the force as everybody being able to draw something some people can be michelangelo and draw the sistine chapel some people can draw stick figures to leave a message to their husband or their wife or their partner but it's all art Mm-hmm. Um, the European sense of art is different from the Pacific Northwest sense of art, different from the South Asian sense of art. And people have fought over what's real art. Well, it's all art. And the same with the force. I can easily see a universe where educated people are, are have different levels of understanding of the force. Like the mm-hmm. various people have different understanding of their own religion. I know theology in the Catholic religion, but I have friends who they don't know anything about that. They grew Mm -hmm. up Catholic. They went to church. That's what they do. And it's the same in other religions, but everybody has, like Leota says, it can access this. This, this is, this isn't something special. Um, At least if for me as an original movie, original trilogy person, original movie person, I see the force as something all of us can get to. Some of us have more talent for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not something unique to certain families. It's it's something that still has to be practiced. You still have to have Jedi masseurs to put them back together again after they've been jumping from buildings. Um, (laughs) I can see Jedi... (laughs) Jedi physicians, I can see Jedi schools, uh, teachers in the academy. I always imagine there'd be some Jedi teaching Jedi way. Jedi ways of flight. How do you ask a good pilot's going to access the Force? You don't have to be a Jedi. Yes, Han can access the Force. He's a damn good pilot. That's how he does it. But they don't think of it that way because. It's part of life. And the other question is, I was just got through, I went through and watched the uh, more episodes with the father and daughter and the son. It will make your mind go off track. It's true. Yes, it will make your mind yeah, go off yeah. track. 
Mm-hmm. It's both a subject. You spent your life talking about it with your father. You spent your life talking with your father. I talked about it with my friends, and I had it at school. My mom got me into science fiction. Mm-hmm. And uh, think about how would the Jedi tackle life and death if this was a matter of uh, physics and everybody knew that your life force continued what would be the attitude toward life and death in the star wars universe as it's developed this is a new concept and they're they're learning about it more uh, with through qui-gon and and yoda's experiences but what if it's physics and everybody knows that reincarnation is not an idea or a philosophy it's a reality Mm-hmm. What if everybody knows you move through different levels of energy? This is a corporal world we're living in. Our philosophies and religions say you go through different levels. Or you come back as different things. What if they've got a good idea going there? Uh, what's the difference between people who grew up with the West, with its linear, progressive concept of religion, from the people who live back east with a circular kind of mm-hmm. religion? What if it isn't religion at all? I wrote the I wrote the force is very secular. Maybe some people treat it as religion, but in general, it was secular because it was the physics. And the empire that I wrote coming in were the secularists mm. who do, who started calling the Jedi religion to to diminish them in people's eyes, to make them separate, mm. not like you. And they say, and these people are saying, look, we've been doing this for 25,000 years. Let's get rid of the Sith and the Jedi altogether because we can, we've got ships, we can fly. We don't need the magic anymore. So it's almost like using it as a way to make it heretical or something like that. Like to say it is, yes. we don't need those hokey religions. We don't need mm-hmm. like, to, to exactly. diminish the, you know, base spirituality. But like, it seems like like the empire itself is very cold because it doesn't mm-hmm. have that yes. spirituality behind it in the Star Wars universe. Yes. Right yes. Now. Yes, very much so. The whole machine versus the whole machine versus man thing that yes. you know, it's it's the machine that's taking over mm-hmm. and the sort of humanity or the natural aspect isn't it's denigrated. And that's why we yes. see like Jedi masters when they are when they go into hiding and they're ashamed of maybe what has happened, they mm-hmm. end up like going to these natural habitats because it's like they are trying to just exist within the nature mm-hmm. aspect of what exists without technology. Yeah. Yes, and when you see, um, and I think everybody has done this in all the movies, is that you have the light side always has sort of a green you you have nature there and a lot of us saw to a great extent what what uh, spirituality we put in with the movies in the beginning is we saw it on very much of a nature level Mm -hmm. because it's hard to go out into the middle of the rainforest and separate yourself yeah and from everything of course that's my prejudice but the empire is extremely mechanical well, you know, that's one thing that they don't go into is economy. You know, mm-hmm. you don't see much on economy in the Star Wars universe. And I bet you could do a lot of writing there that you wouldn't have to worry too much about canon. Uh, they touched on it with Finn and DJ. Yeah, very much so in The yeah. Last Jedi. They touched on it. War is on both sides. Like, it's good or bad. It's as long as you're engaging uh-huh. in war, you're feeding the machine of war yes you have a problem you have a problem you have to deal with they've gone into it a little bit with slavery and how they how the empire deals in slaves and that's how they do a lot of the the work you know for free (laughs) you know not free but you know using personal labor as part of the the machine of war for them how they accomplish things and I always thought that was part of the general, there's this philosophical idea that Palpatine was always trying to create suffering in the galaxy to feed his Uh own power, right? Like from a dark side perspective, you know, I always thought that that was part of it, like to cause suffering was to increase the dark side and, and things like that. 
But I don't know that that's ever handled officially or talked about. It's more just like a something philosophical that we can discuss. Well, there you go. That's what a good legend or a good mythology does is it opens up areas of exploration mm-hmm. on both moral levels and philosophical levels. Well, there's the old problem between philosophy or religion. You need to be able to talk about these things. And that's what I worry about when I see people getting too rigid in the canon, because I don't see where even the canon can be that rigid because they touch on slavery. They Mm -hmm. touch on incoming inequality. Those are areas that you can't lock down. Those are Mm -hmm. squishy areas in experience. People were saying, well, Qui-Gon, why didn't he do something about the slaves? Mm -hmm. Well, if you're going to Mm -hmm. sit there and talk about it, like he said, this is not what he came to do here. This is a bigger problem than what he's dealing with at the moment. And a lot of people don't like that. They, you know, especially when you're young, and I grew up in the 60s generation. So we went through our very narrow, angry young men and women stage. You grow up and you realize I can do one problem at a time. Mm-hmm. We'll do slavery here. Right now, I want to solve this problem. And that doesn't mean I'm a bad guy. It doesn't mean you're super good. It's a, it's a gray world, people. You take light on the circle and you take dark on the circle and you get them at the extremes and both of them blind you. And that's how I've seen the Jedi of the period we're seeing. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. And the Jedi got, got blind. Look, look at this business with getting... Taking kids younger and younger and younger. If I were writing the history of, shall we say, a thousand years ago when apparently something happened, I don't know the EU. I can see where perhaps some humans especially were caused a lot of the trouble. And the Jedi started getting worried that they weren't they weren't getting people young enough. And okay, first we say you gotta get there at puberty. Or then we go to you gotta get there before puberty. Well, I tell you what, how about the age of reason, age of seven? Mm -hmm. (laughs) The Catholics went really good with that. And I can see them moving back and back and forth and getting more and more rigid themselves. Yeah. Heading towards this dogmatic view, like no marriage and no relationships. And and it's like, you know, it's to me where the Jedi are in the second trilogy or, you know, one, two, three, you know how suddenly that one woman burned herself with a McDonald's coffee and then all coffees had to have warning hot on there. (laughs) You know, Mm -hmm. like it's, it's almost like this just layers and layers of rules that had to be put in place because, you know, one or two or three or four people burned the order and suddenly, you know, everybody has to (laughs) have caution. Then you'll be safe. You'll right. finally be safe if everything has a label and everything yes. has a rule. Yes. And, you know, yes. some of the the best stories that I have literally like read in the last few years have been done by, um, you know, Claudia Gray, who wrote Master and Apprentice, um, mm-hmm. which has mm-hmm. Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan's early relationship yes. and how it was interconnected with the Dooku audio drama done by Kevin Scott, where they actually deal with situations where like there's like, you know, relationships on the side Uh uh, babies like brought to the temple under false pretenses like it's all just layered under there to say these things still happen but the dogma doesn't allow it you know (laughs) yes we are seeing the jedi at a difficult point in their history and i i think we have to keep always remember that if we're going to go with obi-wan's a thousand generations comment We've got a very old civilization here. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about our 3,000, 6,000 years since Atsi fell on the glacier and got frozen in the Neolithic era. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about the 3,000 years of the Bible or the 1,500 years of the Koran. We're talking about thousands of years here. There's probably been an up and down and up and down and up and down all through that period. And we're seeing one of those periods where the Jedi have gotten rigid and they're up there at that top of the circle. And most of us live down here at the bottom. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where we have our discussions back and forth and where we learn how to say, okay, this really isn't a moral question here. I can fold the laundry one way and you can fold the laundry another way and I'm not bad and you're not bad. Now that's silly, but that's basically what a lot of these arguments come down to. It's a cliche, you know, love your neighbors, love yourself. Everything else is commentary, you know, type <laughs> of thing. And uh, being good is hard. It isn't safe because we're we tend to be selfish creatures. We want to eat. And you yeah. know, we're, we're going to grab food. If we haven't eaten, we're going to grab food if somebody else has it sitting on the side there. And we're going to argue for the next 2,000 years about whether that's a sin or not. Uh, St. Augustine is going to tell you that that baby's crying for milk at his mother's breast, but that's a sin. Mm-hmm. And people are going to decide whether they're going to go along with St. Augustine or the people who argued against St. Augustine. And we all know, and unfortunately, we went along with St. Augustine at that time. <laughs> this is the human in existence. And Star Wars presents, George has managed to do it. He's managed to present in a modern way that we can relate to, even as our tech is changing, the problems that we face every day in deciding what is something to fight over, one is something to argue about, what you are going to do, what you are not going to do, and how you're going to accept the fact that somebody else is a good person, even if they don't do it the same way you do. Mm -hmm. And so this is what worries me about all these canon arguments. Yeah. So I I recently Mm -hmm. finished Russian Doll, which... Uh (laughs) <laughs> I, it it's very Star Wars. And of course, the showrunner for that is going to be making a Star Wars show. So I'm very excited. Mm-hmm. That was yes. that, that was one of my my joys. But there's this amazing line and, and it leans into kind of philosophically how I view Star Wars so much. And I was like, I'm very glad. And in the same episode, they talk about Life Force, which also made me very, very happy. Mm -hmm. But if you haven't seen it totally, I I highly recommend it. Holding two incompatible ideas in your head at the same time and accepting them both is the best of being human. And that's Ruth in the show that she says that. And And it's very much like that idea that you have to be in some ways selfish to exist, to not give Mm -hmm. up your life for Mm -hmm. others uh, by consuming the energy of the universe or meat or Mm -hmm. vegetables. You are eating of the universe. You are consuming. You are being selfish. But then, you know, how do you try to give that forward with your selfless actions and the balance in a very Zen Buddhist kind of way Mm -hmm. is finding how you ride in the middle and much to some of the philosophical conversations that have happened in universe, which is awesome. And I love that. How are you leaning into the light and adding to other people and, and loving other people with compassion and joy? You know, to me, that's where we get caught up a lot in this black and white binary of good versus <sighs> evil or dark versus light. Like, yes, the world is quote unquote binary, but actually, when you look at it, it's not. You are both black and white, you are both good and bad. You produce good and bad results for everything that you do. And like, that's where people just like, Oh, you know, Luke was good. Well, actually, (laughs) you know, (laughs) yeah. And we get into this whole thing and people just can only see the black and white. They can't necessarily see the fact that, like, to your point, if you have black and white, you're blinded by both. Like, yeah. yeah. And Susan can tell us how long ago it was that the God was driving the chariot into the war field and the king was saying i can't fight these people Mm -hmm. they're my cousins and the god is saying and you live in the time you're in you do what has to be done at the moment you you have to do your duty you do your duty and you accept the consequences i always remember my father was in world war ii he was in the pacific he was in the islands and uh the war, war wasn't as tidy there as it was in Europe, if even Europe could be called tidy. And he, what he told me was some 
sometimes there's nothing left to do but to fight because you have to stop the other guy from doing what he's doing because it's hurting people. Mm-hmm. And uh, on the grand scale, it is not a good thing what he is doing. So you go, you fight, you do things that you really wish you didn't have to do. And then you stop the guy, you come home, you put the uniform away, you get married, you have kids, you can be part of the community, and you come to terms with what you had to do, and you realize that you can go forward and do other things. He says, it doesn't draw you down, it doesn't kill you, but you know that you are capable of doing those things now. And you're a better person for knowing that you're capable of doing it. And so you go ahead and you do life affirmative. I like the phrase life affirmative. Mm. That really struck me as a child and stayed with me because sometimes you have to do something. You have to stop somebody else. You, you, and you ha- Your fate is to be put into a position sometimes where you have to be the person who says enough. Mm-hmm. And that's a hard position to be in. But we all have to live with the consequences of what decisions we make. Parents run into it. The eternal argument between parents about whether you're going to be the kid's friend or whether you're going to be the mean mom who says no. <laughs> You make the decision which one you're going to be at or somewhere in the middle. You accept the downsides mm-hmm. because you're unable to do anything. You mm-hmm. accept the cost. Luke was a little extreme. I don't blame him. I personally, at the end of Jedi, I thought Luke was going to go off and just say, bye-bye. <laughs> I've been through this. I'm done. Leia wants to go and do her politicking. Go right ahead. <laughs> like you thought he would leave the galaxy and kind of be off on his own. I thought he then? would. I thought the odds were good. The, I saw him. Mm-hmm. I saw him flying back in the shuttle, coming back with his body of of uh, Anakin, and saying, "That is not the face of somebody who's very, very happy." <laughs> and yeah. I can. Uh, Leia had a family. I mean, she, she, had, she grew up in a very positive. She had she had something to do. She had a goal. She had all kinds of things to make her confident. And she took after Anakin a lot in her temperament, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> so she had that, that temperament that said, go, I'm going to go be able to do it. So I see him taking a lot more like his mother or Shmi or his grandmother. Luke didn't. Luke had his aunt and uncle. It wasn't a mom and dad. And Owen did not strike me as somebody who was terribly comfortable with the situation. No. I, <laughs> Luke sort of growing up a little loosey-goosey on his own, out shooting womp rats. That doesn't strike me as the kind of personality who is, uh, is going to be as confident as Leia. Mm-hmm. And so, I, yeah, I, I saw Luke going away. I didn't write for a while. Luke Skywalker for a while after the end of Jedi because that was the way he was in the movies and I didn't want to bother him. <laughs> I wanted to No no the- plot bunnies formed. One of my one of my good friends uh calls them plot bunnies. <laughs> yes. So Star Wars shows its consequences. And I think that's a good thing. I know some yeah. people don't like it, but I think it's a good thing. Superheroes are not realistic. I understand that kids need to have a black, um, some black and white stories because they're still figuring out what good what and bad black is. and white. Yeah, what black and white are. Yeah, they're still right. figuring out what it is. But one of the reasons Star Wars could appeal to me at twenty, even Baby Yoda doesn't know he's pre-verbal. Yeah, that's a whole other show <laughs> <laughs> discussion. <Yeah. laughs> but anyway, Baby Baby Yoda. I, I have people who had given up on Star Wars and were brought back in through Baby Yoda. <laughs> what I'm curious about from what you're saying is I'm trying to imagine a world in which like there's only one Star Wars mm-hmm. movie ah. or like there's only two Star Wars mm-hmm. movies or something like that. And I remember thinking when I was a kid that it was black and white. There was the Jedi and the Sith and that was it. Like, and you just needed to be on the side of the Jedi. And it was very black and white. And that maybe that was because I saw it as a child. And so like you were saying, children need to see those black and white things because later you'll realize that life is, isn't all black and white. And so what's interesting to me from, 
from you talking is that having encountered it first as an adult, you already saw that it was more nuanced than that. I don't want to say, I don't know if I want to say gray, but it was more nuanced than that. And that like Luke already had some dark things Mm -hmm. inside of him. We shouldn't have been shocked to find out that, you know, he gave into fear at some point or that even from the beginning, even from the first movie that like fear was a major corrupting influence, you know, that, you know, because that's become a theme, you know, in, in empire and a lot of the other later stuff that like fear is what does you in more than anything. And I was like really surprised. I mean, like pleasantly surprised to see that even after just one movie, like you and your friends had already begun to talk about how, you know, things like fear could really be the the thing that causes humans to go wrong <laughs> or like have have ethical trouble. Understand. So that was that was really fascinating to me. I think it's one reason as see having seen it as an adult like you're saying, one reason why I really, really have no patience for uh, cosplay of Imperials. Um, I'm oh. polite. <laughs> the, the line oh, in the sand. Maggie has a line in the sand. It's that's just my person. What, why? Why do you feel that way? Why? I mean, like, even if, if if we, why? Why not? You know, like, you know, play with the darkness that's in us. Is um, that? Are you? I, I, are you saying you don't want to acknowledge? Like, we shouldn't. What do you think? I worry that it's treated, ends up being treated too lightly. I worry about cynicism. We take the recognition that everybody has their downtime, shall we say, that everybody has uh, the things Mm. that they will lie about, that they regret, and we turn Mm. it into a joke. If you're not perfect, you're not good. If you're not perfect, I can dismiss um, what you do uh, that is good. Oh, you see that in politics a lot. Okay, somebody made a mistake when he was 25 years old. We have to be very careful about how we judge that mistake. Did this person change? Has this person acknowledged what they've done? I recognize that, like George said, he wanted he, he understood the kids would want to pretend they were Darth Vader because then they were always right and they were strong. I've got a problem with that. And I understand the the um, discussion about people who grew up with the empire and they think this is their reality. And I can do that. I worry just about the, the treating it a little bit too casually. And maybe what I'm talking about is folks who are just taking it as, as fun and I'm taking it too seriously. It's entirely possible that I'm taking it all <laughs> too seriously. Like what I'm hearing from you is actually uh, like something that I actually discuss on the podcast a lot, which is that we don't have in Star Wars the journey home from the dark side. People who are dark die, right? Even if they redeem and they attempt to atone, the only way that they atone is through death. And we don't have a how do we make the universe and bring back in a Joseph Campbellian way the truth of the fact that you were in the dark side and bring back the lessons learned, that elixir, yeah. to the galaxy to say, hey, look, I went to the dark side and I was able to come back. And these are the lessons that I learned that, you know, just because you make one mistake yeah. doesn't mean that you should give up on yourself or others. And we didn't yes. get that with Ben Solo. And that to me is a regret because it could have been a very powerful moment, especially for our young men to see when kids growing up to say, hey, if you make a mistake, you're not necessarily done for. And that's when you see the transformation from that dark side person or that imperial person or that first order person into somebody who's like, no, I'm now a good person or I'm trying or I'm on my road back. And because we haven't seen that transformation, except for the old man Vader who dies and burns, we don't see that resolution. And I think that's still missing in our psyche from a mythic perspective. And that's where I think we should have seen it in the Jedi. That's why I like Qui-Gon a great deal. Yes. <laughs> because he seems to grasp that. Yep. Yeah. We just see the extremes. We see people who have done horrible things. And so mm-hmm. it's very easy to say, 
okay, I can't see any way this person's going to be able to come back except if he becomes a monk in a monastery and uh, and you know, does little deeds for the rest of his life. Yeah. See that interim period. And that's where you have probably more problems for adults with, with the series. Mm-hmm. That summer of 77, sitting there with my friends, I even remember which who, whose apartment we were in, saying, okay, what isn't Obi-Wan telling Luke? <laughs> because we all saw it as grown-ups saying, and I, I went back when the DVDs came out, and I'm sitting there going frame by frame. On There's it, a pregnant you know, pause. To where he's not saying something. Kins has got that moment of, okay, what am I going to do now? There were a lot of arguments in the early days about not telling Luke um, mm. who his father was. That, those were arguments that people simply agreed not to agree on. I had a friend once. She's gone now. She had, had, she had, she had married a bad boy, a big, nasty bad boy. Realized it was a mistake. Unfortunately, she was already pregnant. And but she she left him while she was still pregnant and married somebody that she knew was a good man. And I said, have you ever told your son who his that Jerry isn't his father? And she said, no. Hmm. I said, he doesn't need to know that he had such a snake for his father, for his sire, for his Hmm. biological donor. And she died never having told him. And I don't know if Jerry ever eventually did, because we he's lost track of him. He's now listening to this podcast, and he's like, <laughs> Maggie, what are you talking about? No, no. Well, but like that is that is a shadow, right? Like that is a shadow yes. on that person. That is like from a Jungian, you know, psychology or a, yes. a Robert Bly perspective. That is a shadow yes. that he is unaware of and he is carrying around with him, much like Luke, yep. you know, you know, not knowing who he was. Yes. And then it hits even harder as an adult, I think, or you're not able to process it maybe in the same way. Yeah. It, it's a real question. And yeah. Obi-Wan makes his decisions and, you know, and, and parents make those decisions all the time, you know, with, yes. you know, do I, um, I've spoken with many people who had, you know, it, it, people, it's so funny because like uh, Star Wars ends up becoming almost like a frame for psychology in so many ways. That's my <laughs> yes. background. And, yes. And, and like, people are like, like, I grew up and my father is in prison. And it's like, oh, you know, like, that that's, that's yeah. their life. And that is their shadow. And so they identify with people like Luke, or they identify with yes. people like Ben Solo, who have this history, this family shadow, that is actually a galactic wide shadow, <laughs> that they just yes, haven't is. had it had a mm-hmm. way to deal with. And it's like, like, that's, what we look for in our stories as yes. these characters go through these experiences they process and it helps us at least momentarily as we're seeing things through their eyes process things and it's mm-hmm. okay to do that and to take from the story what you want and if you're yes. like you know that didn't work out for that character but i know you know even though Ben Solo died, like I know, hey, I've made a mistake in my life and I made up for it or t- I chose to come back from it. I won't die. I'm going to live, you know, and like that's mm-hmm. that's where like it's OK to have a different perspective than necessarily what even the whole Internet is telling you. Oh, the, you know, the, can, you know, the you world ex- should be like, yeah, can, can you explain to me? Because this is your reality and that wasn't my reality. Why everybody takes so personally the idiots out there who make the oh. comments? Oh, on the internet? <laughs> yes. Uh, so, because I keep wanting to reach through to the girls and say, why are you listening to him? Yeah. Or, yeah. you know, or, or, hey, this person's perspective is different than my own. There was a media philosopher called Marshall McLuhan in the yeah. mid mid nineteen hundreds. Do you yeah. are you aware of his work? No, he had the, with the him. yeah the global village concept and and with yes. especially social media, we have become more so even even to what he expected in some yeah. ways. It's it's right along. He's like we'll have instantaneous communication, and so everybody 
lives in a small village. And yes. so yes. so psychologically, it is literally like your neighbor is saying something like, oh, Ray, she's not a good character. And like literally you can hear it. So yeah. you have yeah. no you have no ability to filter that out in the same way because because of technology the reach of of our perception through that technology yes. makes us feel like we are all in this tight little village and you end up having this very village like politics yes. that come forward in social media um i did actually did a whole episode on this as star wars is a multimedia um, okay, yeah the name I, of that one so I can look it up. It wasn't really from a social media perspective. It was more just how if Star Wars wants to be very clear with its messaging because it's spread over so many different types of mediums, those are absorbed in different ways as humans. Uh, yes. And yeah. so they have to be very, very clear with especially the, the thematic messaging that they give across because not only is the medium... Um, what they present, so the movies, the television shows, the books, mm -hmm. the comic books, all of these multi, the VR, the g going to the ga oh. going to Galaxy's Edge, like it's not just all of that. It is also the internet's reaction to that. It is also the YouTube reaction to that. It is also this podcast. It's also the fan fiction that people write. And so, if their base on what they want to give us as fans and media consumers, they need to make sure that what they are thematically giving to us is very, very clear. That's Using a, a lens point. of Marshall, Marshall McLuhan. Yeah. Yeah. The medium is the message. Yes, I always exactly. The medium is the massage, but yeah, that's. <laughs> that was a um, misprint. No. <laughs> <laughs> but he loved it. He loved it. I've I've listened to so much Marshall McLuhan because um he's actually from my province where I where I oh, am at. Oh. Yeah, so he's a Canadian and okay. yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> Part of the challenge is that technology has brought us closer together, yeah. but in in the way that we don't so like you think about the fanzines and because the only way that you had to communicate was through this long term, you know, you had yeah. to think mm -hmm. about the messaging that you were trying yes. to get across to make sure yes. it was very clear because you had one yes. shot at it. I can yeah. tweet out a million things, have half of them be wrong and still be successful. Like that's that's the differences in in the medium mm -hmm. itself and how we communicate in this new world because technology is just an extension of humanity. It just establishes us yeah. to be able to have these conversations easier. But basically Twitter is just everybody yelling in their backyard and everybody can hear it. And, and you're <laughs> right. You're right. I, I know there are times when I feel that I was lucky to have grown up in a more private time because, you know, I didn't want to live in a small town. <laughs> I want to live in a city no. where not everybody knows what I'm doing. And now on the net, it's all one giant small town and everybody knows what yeah. you're doing. And it's gossip. News has turned into gossip. Yep. So, yes, you're right. You, re you reminded me of that. And I had I had forgotten it. One thing I did want to bring up when I was thinking about this uh, talking to you is I, one problem I have with the way the Star Wars universe is presented in the movies is uh, something that other people brought up with worlds who are thought of as one ecology, mm -hmm. you know, and the whole world's a desert, the whole world's a, a forest and things like that. But also the, um, the conformity across galactic distances. Mm. I have a real hard time seeing the empire even after 20 years being able to run everything so similar on so many planets mm. and that's where i have to kick back and say okay fairy tale time and that's where i miss the politics and the sociology shall we say yeah and maybe i can't i just can't expect that of the movies i'm asking for a different kind of story I, I actually am a massive like political fan from a story <laughs> perspective. Like I love it when we have politics based on, you know, again, 
human need conflicting with each other, right? I want power or I want control or I'm trying to prevent you from controlling or or overpowering me. So I have to like I love these these things that develop from a political perspective. And so I've always wanted a political show like either underworld politics or Senate young Palpatine show would be really, really fun. And then suddenly everyone would humanize him. And then and then we would all be like, well, maybe he should have been redeemed. And I would have been like, yes. (laughs) <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm an extremist when it comes to redemption in star wars i think everyone should be uh, well, <laughs> um, i got no but, problem with that i think at least everybody should get the opportunity get the opportunity yeah to and then, it, then it's up to them like yeah, yeah. uh right. but uh, like i think that that will lean into the longer format shows like we got way more politics in clone wars Mm -hmm. we got a little bit in in rebels i just Mm -hmm. think that because these things take time to develop there's possibly many players especially when you're talking like oh i want something that is on a galactic scale or even small scale or you know whatever like if they want to do sopranos in star wars (laughs) they need to have much more of an establishing like pace to the show where yes. they can actually establish yes. characters that are repetitive and yes. have desires. And when they cut back to that person, you still know who that person is. Whereas in the two hour format of the show, we just or in a movie. We just don't movie, have yeah. that time mm-hmm. to really do yes. as much unless that is the entire focus of that movie. And and that might be what it is. But then you might get people who are like, well, this wasn't a Star Wars show because there was no war in my stars. And it's like, well, nah. <laughs> it takes yeah. all kinds. <laughs> I, wish I, could, I wish I could come back as a little fly in the wall to see how they reboot Star Wars in 50 years. Yes. Because the people there will have the whole story as it, as it grew in real time. And they will look at it and say, OK, this was missing. That was missing. Can we go here more? Can we go there more? I want to know how Mo Mothma and Bail Organa managed to stay alive long enough yeah. to keep the alliance going. I mean, if you were Palp, um, Palpatine probably thought he had compromised Bail because of the military acts and such during the Clone mm-hmm. Wars. That- Giving him enough power and rope to yeah. like, hang himself with. Same with Mon Mothma because she was also like in there. Like maybe that was part of it. Like he felt... Like he controlled well, we them. haven't seen it with Mon Mothma. I'm a real Mon Mothma fan because I, you know, for God's sakes, people, she's not a figurehead. She yeah, is the head of the alliance. Quit treating, giving her to us like mommy. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, too many of the books, too many of the stories I've seen, she comes in to be mom. And I feel like I'm back in 1958 watching Father Knows Best because she had to have been a real sharp cookie. Mm-hmm. To have uh, managed to stay alive, uh, I always, I always wrote her as a much sharper political person. Back before we knew what happened with um, the prequels, back before the prequels, we had one universe. Bev and I used to sit around. We talked about one universe where Mon Mothma was Anakin's love interest because they were both interested in politics, and they broke up. Well, Mo Mothma broke up with him because of the way he was going with his politics. I mean, and you were kind of going. wrong in a way because Padme was that's, like kind of like that character. Yeah, oh, 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 that brings yeah. up something. I, think. I don't know if you've noticed, but I've been looking. Well, I've been looking at both our fan fiction and such. I've really noticed that however diverse people get with their interpretations of Star Wars, there are some areas that still keep following a similar line. I'm super excited. Okay. Yes. (laughs) Yes, this. Fan fiction 40 years ago. I'm even looking at my own stories and I'm saying, wow, that's the same way they were thinking because the, the overall structure guides us in a certain way, the basic Mm -hmm. idea of story. And so even though you can have like, Mothma being one way here, but they both still are going in this direction. And I find that absolutely fascinating. 
to me, that's really fascinating because it's like, you know, people associate certain things with Star Wars, like the themes of family and found yes. family and like especially George, mm -hmm. what he would talk about with just like, you know, this is a family soap opera. You know, what does yeah. that mean? Oh, God, um, yes. You know, the 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 good and bad yeah. and, and how you how you resolve through those things, you know, the um, the the idea that, you know, things are about hope. You know, and and like even to um, a more recent gallery of the Mandalorian um, or sorry, the Clone Wars conversations that he had about the end of Clone Wars with Dave Filoni. Yeah. He's like, you know, remember to uplift the kids because they need it. Like, like it's about that. And and like, you yes. know, if we see that in the media that is produced, then we know that they're still having those same conversations and it's got a little bit of an intentionality or it's just baked into the DNA of how we think about Star Wars so much on a fundamental, like almost cellular level. Yes, 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 very much so. I like to play in my mind when I'm in line or something. I, I don't I don't use a smartphone. I don't work anymore. I don't have to have a smartphone. Mm -hmm. And besides which, I make up stories in my mind when I'm standing in line instead of doing solitaire. Uh, but I, I like to take the different Obi-Wans I've seen in different storylines and in, in fanzines and imagine, okay, you're Obi-Wan, this Obi-Wan. Let me show you what this other Obi-Wan was like. And you know, watch and see what reactions you would have and what similarities you could put. Uh, that's the kind of finish, finish storylines where you get to see where what has to be the same for this mm -hmm. character to stay the character. Mm. When you're writing somebody for like you're writing a character that's fairly well known, like Obi Wan, or um, that people yeah. have a lot of I don't know familiarity with, you yeah. know what what makes it so that character no longer sounds like that character or yes. is that character and what is that bar because like one thing that I find when I'm reading fanfic is that the character truly being embodied in that moment and not being out of character yes. is what makes a fanfic yes. for me personally that's always been part of the game is people will say okay this threw me out of the story because I could not imagine that mm -hmm. character doing what you have have the character doing so that that's always been part of the the critique on fab stories that i remember but i think that it's also part of like the critique like i i listened to a lot of critique of the last jedi because i wanted to understand like why i felt so differently than some people especially men who had a very particular view of luke oh, you yeah. know and, and how much Luke had, was a particular way in The Last Jedi, to me, it made sense because of, you know, what was presented in the universe yeah. and who he was. Like, I feel like The Last Jedi did a really great job of him and, and actually gave us such a good ending <laughs> to his story that was really glorious. Oh, that I yeah. cry every day. Yeah. But, but I think that, like, people had built up this especially readers of the EU or, you know, people who grew up with the original trilogy, they had this idea, maybe they were kids or maybe they were young adults looking at Big Luke and how he was able to be successful and what kind of a hero he was. And, you know, they couldn't reconcile those two pictures, old man Luke and <laughs> young man Luke, you know, like, I don't know. I because like if you look at the EU, you can never tell how old those characters are in the end yeah. they have adult children but yet they're still kind of young you know and they're yeah. still yeah so the legends now are you know as a in a in my one of my other good friends are like i grew up with expensive fan fiction <laughs> <That's what she laughs> oh gosh you know? yes you know if i were just sitting here i'm talking with somebody i would have a hard time imagining myself how anybody could look at luke in jedi and still see him as your casual superhero. Mm -hmm. When Vader makes the comment about Leia, Luke just loses it. You have a sister? Mm -hmm. Well, that's when Luke takes off after Vader and just absolutely, mm -hmm. totally loses it. I blame some of it on Marvel and DC. Mm -hmm. That that period was the same period. As, yeah, the, sil as the Silver Age of comics was the same period of yeah. time. Yeah. I read comics when I was a kid and I gave them up when I was about 10 or 11. 
Um, I, the last one I read was Batman because he could still be hurt. And I got real tired of superheroes who couldn't be hurt because I didn't believe them. I just didn't believe them. But eventually I gave them up because they, they always won. Even when they lost, they ended up winning because they came back and they retold the story. And you know what? I have not run into this conversation, and maybe you have had people complaining about Luke. Yes. Have you run into many people complaining about the fact that Han and Leia, I mean, that Han and Leia didn't stay together? Yes. Really? Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Lots of people. Cheered you cheered? I cheered in the theater when they did it right. Because I, I sat there and I said, yes, please. I was going to see the movie and I was going to be worried. And yet I could not imagine those two living happily ever after, year after year. I really had a trouble with that. And when they in the movie said that, showed me that they were being what I thought realistic That was Larry it. Kasdan. I'm sure of it. I, well, okay. <laughs> and, well, hey. Larry told us all about how he wanted Chewie to be very jealous of Leia's and on relationship, and George wouldn't let him do it. <laughs> and that's what the lunch we had with 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 Kasdan. He was he was telling us all about that because he thought it was perfectly natural. These guys have been running around together, and suddenly you aren't going out for a drink of beer with me because you're going out with her. I mean, that happens all the time with guys and gals. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yes, I, I have to admit, um, I was very, very happy to see the way they handled it. I thought the actors played it well mm-hmm. and the way they were, you know, nagging at each other. You're at the age, no offense, Maggie, but to say, yeah. hey, I've been through it. And you know what? Sometimes <laughs> things don't always oh, work yes. out. Yes. And what I loved about especially the sequel trilogy and and some of the messages TFA and TLJ especially and, and a little bit into Tross with um with with Lays that they say like it's never too late to still be a hero, you know, to still mm-hmm. do your part. And and I really love that personally. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah, it's um yeah. oh where was I going to go? This is one reason why fans sit around and talk for five hours because it takes them that long to remember everything they wanted to say three hours ago. <laughs> I remember but one of the big fights that came up, oh, big fights, big disagreements that came up after after Return of the Jedi were the fans who had read their Joseph Campbell and they wanted a wedding by God at the end. We, you know, they felt that the old stories and everything that the there should have been a wedding, you know, to to finish off the story there nicely and support the community, and then you get married and have babies. I, I didn't. I wasn't of that group. I had no problem seeing Luke and Leia. I'm mean, hot and Leia having a great, you know, mm-hmm. hot, uh, because they were both. They both struck me as people. <sighs> who needed to work something out in their lives and get the two of them together, work it out together, realize that, yes, Han, you can be vulnerable. And yes, Leia, you can put the rebellion aside for a few minutes and just get down with somebody. And they'd work it out between each other. And then they'd stay friends the rest of their life while they went out and found their own, you know, permanent mate so i i got into a lot of trouble with the people who wanted the big wedding <laughs> I, can, I can understand the wedding desire because it's very fairy tale right yeah i could under- yeah yeah it well it's like i can understand people who i can understand though we've got to save ben even though i think it was beautifully handled i love the way the actors did it mm-hmm. um i like that smile at the end, that was just absolutely gorgeous, and uh, and yet it made perfect sense in the way the story was told. Then Wood died because it was very sad. I, I'll give you that; it was very sad. But I I I just felt they handled it. But I can understand why the other side of the issue. Mm-hmm. I I do think it would be difficult in the real world. But then again, I'm bringing my real world Star Wars into it. In I I think. I think they have a real hard time convincing people that he's been solo now and not Kylo. That's the challenge is that like we don't have those as a tradition. We don't yeah. have stories home. We don't have yes. the road back home from a no. from a darkness perspective. And yes. and I feel like that's still missing from 
from the story because yeah. we will only see him in the dark side swishy cape, right? And and that's back yeah. to the earlier conversation is that, uh, you know, that's what we're used to is we're we're used to seeing this atonement by death result. Um, yeah. But but I think that that's where we are actually missing this this conversation about what does the road back home actually look like, yes. especially for Han and Leia's son. Like, yes, you know, don't we didn't we want to see the baby boy actually come home, which was the mother's I like only goal. But what does home mean? Right. Like, is it just that he came back and he was able to make a difference or is it something bigger to do with, you know, now he actually gets to live his life through the sacrifices of his parents? I don't know. And we never yeah. really got those answers. I'm no, sorry, and Susan. That's true. <laughs> and, and, and that may just also be a so, function of our losing Carrie. Yeah. Yeah. Because um Carrie, first of all, she was a great script writer and great script fixer. <laughs> she would have yelled at JJ over some of those lines, I think. <laughs> or, yeah, I hope so. Uh, <laughs> um so so yes, yes. Uh but then again, is fan fiction. That's where fan fiction comes in. Yeah. I've seen so many fix it fix come out. Like there's been yeah. like huge amounts of people because people needed to see either a different result or like what yeah. happened after or you yeah. know, hey, a, a completely different version of the movie. People are are all about mm -hmm. that and people did versions of the movies there, but it doesn't invalidate people's experience yeah. and that could be yeah. what they needed, you know? Yes. 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 Oh gosh, Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting to the point where Star Wars is kind of anything that people choose to embrace and consume, including fan niche works, right? Their fan films, yeah. their fan yeah. art, their, yeah. you know, yeah. it's only it's only their unique perspective. And so I feel like we need to become more accepting of alternative perspectives and just say, hey, that's cool for you. It doesn't work for me. <laughs> How do we start a, a movement going on the idea that Star Wars is always personal for each individual person? And so therefore, we should be open to everything. You can say, I like the movie canon. I mean, because right now there's there's even a big between people who only go by the movies and people who read the books or people who do all the uh, the games and mm -hmm. such, we should not, how can we get a, a, a something going that says, don't look at the differences, don't look at the different branches of the tree, take the whole tree and enjoy it. And uh, how do we promote people thinking that way without getting people angry that you missed me because uh, people will say if you missed me and didn't mention me specifically then you're excluding me and that may be just the point of time we're in in the world that is part of it is that people don't want to feel like if i say star wars fans are good people that would that will cause a fight because oh, people yeah. don't want to be generalized, mm -hmm. but then they also don't want to be excluded. So I think that what we need to do is just continuously promote the idea that everybody's Star Wars is personal and choosing yeah. to take from it what you love and then not bash somebody else's experience. Like, turn towards the light, everyone. <laughs> Seek your joy. Seek your joy and your love. You know, and don't squish somebody else's joy and love. Like that's like that's all we can do. And yeah, it helps me to know that like that was basically, you know, the original perspective on it was that the world was the universe was so big that everybody could have their own Star Wars mm -hmm. even from the beginning. Yeah, and that if we, you know, and uh, even if we, um, you know, like like you know. I don't like I don't like um, spaceships. I'm not into spaceships. There's some people who are yeah. like super into yeah. spaceship, spaceships. Yeah. Fine, great. You're you can be into spaceships. <laughs> Just to know that like part of the DNA of Star Wars is also that from the beginning, 
imaginative universes were being created that yes. expanded off of the original story and that we're just doing something that continues what was already being done before. And that's part of the narrative of being a Star Wars yes. fan. Yes. Is that what we do is create those universes. Mm-hmm. I think we also have to get away from the to be valuable, I must be right. Oh, gosh, yes. Yes, yes, yeah. You know, and so uh, they, by 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 putting your voice out there, people should also assume that you're only speaking for yourself. Yes. Like, you know, yes. and I and I yes. run into this, like, I'm like, I'm going to use Robert Bly as a lens to look at Star Wars and the dark and light and stuff like that in this moment, or I'm going to use Joseph Campbell, or I'm going to use Maureen Murdoch and talk yeah. about it actually from a heroine's journey perspective, because we have a heroine in the sequel trilogy. So what is that from a different storytelling perspective? I always try to frame things, but some people still yeah. want to be right because that is the only you know value that they can get right now i think you know in some ways they feel safe and we're right back to fear of not being um, a lot of people grow up being afraid of not being right and i can understand that because i had that kind of a mother <laughs> i can understand where that comes from i'm curious like because you know between like A New Hope and Empire yeah. and then between Empire and Return of the Jedi, there were three years and there was like, so I can imagine, you know, between each of those, like now how much speculation goes on between like two years or even like a week between Mandalorian episodes, like what's going to happen. There must've been so much room for yes. speculation and what people's reactions were to be like, ah, I got it right. Like I knew Luke was going to do that or, you know, or being like personally confirmed or affirmed by the story. You know, I remember seeing t- going there, Empire. We had stood in line, sat in line for 12 hours, drink, eating fried chicken and drinking Jedi Joy juice, which was cranberry with 151. And we got to, and we got to that first snow field where the ships are going up and down and up and down and we thought next time no jedi joy juice um but yes i found myself <laughs> in empire and something happened and part of my brain immediately went wait a minute no so and so would have oh that's right that was my character uh and it was my it was what i had spent three years working on so you did have that experience and and so i guess i got as of 1980 I knew I had to accept George's point of view as an alternate point of view. You can't fight it. People have yeah. different points of view. So we learned the hard way yeah. that you can be invested in your own personal Star Wars, but you have to sit back and say, this is mine. But yes, having three years to play, I I thought about what just what you said, Susan, about, my God, there's only a year between or a year and a half between these movies there's no time mm-hmm. to really work it out. I mean, I'm sorry. In, in my Thousand Worlds universe, Luke and Leia are married <laughs> because they ain't brother and sister. Yeah. Because they, and, you know, that's what you had back then. Yeah. That's what I had. Right. And I found a way to come up with the reason Luke made Leia laugh in the middle of all the hassles that went on. Country, good old backwater rim world loop could make center world sophisticated leia laugh and leia gave luke a way to escape being the big jedi by he could still be old luke mm. who just hung out with the kids at and so with leia he could be nobody except just luke and that's the way i looked at that relationship and then i gave Han a, a, a lady to uh, have problems with. <laughs> and, and, and then they split. After the war was won and everything was settled and Vader was taken care of, they split because he couldn't deal with he couldn't deal with the changed world. He came back after 15 years. but So that's probably why. I, so in no universe could Han stay in married. In no universe, no, he did come back once he, well, you know, I loved it when Harrison Ford sat up on that dais at a celebration and somebody 
called him on how much he hated Han as a character to play. And he took a big sigh and says, well, I guess I grew up or I got older. Oh. And I just loved that because that's, that's him accepting his Han, his inner Han. Mm -hmm. He was good, so very good at Han because that's who part of him was, is. Yeah, because he is Harrison and, and, and that comes yeah. through and that exudes, you know, and, and I yes. think that Carrie accepted, you know, her inner Princess Leia very yes. quickly, especially like after Return of the Jedi, she, she finally accepted it. But I think she struggled with like, mm -hmm. the yeah, fandom and the fame for many years. And, and like, that's, that's the thing that we have to become more understanding of is that like everybody has their own version of the truth and that's not exclusionary. That's actually really beautiful that everybody, you know, views things mm -hmm. and has these unique perspectives. It's radically inclusionary. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It can be radically inclusionary. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and we don't have to agree like that to me is beautiful. We've got the, the 1970 movie, 1977 movie is the core. That is Star Wars. I don't even call it a new hope anymore because that's Star Wars. It has all the basic story points you need to be able to create a viable universe. George went one way. Disney is going its way. I went one way. My friend Pat Nussman went her way, but we all come back to that basic rootstock and graft everybody else's universe on that rootstock, but the rootstock is still there. Well, thank you, Maggie, for <laughs> all your insight. That. This has been so much fun. I've and enjoyed myself a great deal. Like fascinating and interesting and like this discussion went way all over the place which is awesome no it, no no yeah. really awesome because it's like religion and philosophy and like how we view this medium and this this story and this mythic telling because like that's basically like down to the base what it is is that it's speaking to us as humans and it speaks uh -huh. kind of in in many ways cross-culturally yeah. um yeah so like i love that you've given us this like very wonderful view of the history especially of fandom which is something that you know not many people realize that the same discussions that we were having back then we're still having now and that you know it's all part of the fact that we are humans trying to resolve something that means something deeply to us and that yes with a little bit more compassion and understanding for other people's perspectives we can get there too and if you're a young girl and somebody tells you you can't be a Star Wars fan, just laugh hysterically and tell them that you have grandmothers who were Star Wars fans because we're all here. And, and Maggie's going to uh, go fight you. <laughs> no, <just kidding>. <laughs> <laughs> Maggie's going to laugh, going to say, yes, dear, and have a cookie. <laughs> well, <laughs> because, you know, all, you, all the girls need to know that you have got many, many women behind you in history we were there we've all got stories to tell and and you have mountains of paper to prove it maggie i i'm gonna have you back that's that's what it's gonna be we're gonna have you back and we're gonna talk maggie if people are looking for you and they want to know more about you i know maggie Novakoska, my al like i said al3 is maggie.novakoska well, and also you're on Twitter as well, which is uh, how we managed to connect. I've got to get onto it more often. I Twitter is so noisy. It is very so, noisy. Oh, and I still haven't figured out how to. Somebody will put an example, a, a comment on there that they sent to me and somebody else. And I look at it and I say, what was this in response to? So I'm going to try tweet that for various different kinds of things. I'm old, so I'm on Facebook. Uh, well, thank you for giving us your you. insight and your wisdom and your joy and your love. Um, and it's it's just really been wonderful to have this conversation with you. I've enjoyed talking with both of you, and I. Uh, I told Susan I really enjoyed your particular podcast on the, the Hindu background. 
that was really fascinating. I loved it immensely. Well, we did. We also did one about animals oh, yeah. too. Oh. We did one about animals in Star Wars. So you oh, should yes. listen I'm to that too. I'm, I'm going to have to sit down and go through all of that. And uh, Susan, yeah. where can people find you? I'm on Twitter as at Night Sister Ashla. Oh. So N I G H T S I S T R, no final E, A S H L A. Oh, that's right. My Twitter is not, my Twitter is Maggie D N D N G. I think you mm. you probably haven't. Let me check. My nickname we'll was my nickname there. was Dragon. So um, I use variations on that. I keep yes. forgetting. Sorry, that you're different. yes, you are Maggie D G N. <laughs> Dragon. Yeah. Perfect. Mm-hmm. Thank you for listening to What the Force. I'm Marie Claire Gould, your host. Our music is the What the Force theme, orchestral music by Christy Carew for What the Force. We have a Patreon at patreon.com slash what the force. We would like to thank all our patrons, especially those who love and are obsessed with What the Force. Brad, Cheryl Bell, Melody, Night Huntress in Wild Space, Susan, Felicia, How Rude, Anna Perez, Macau Mum, Neil, and James. Make sure to like and subscribe on YouTube or leave a five-star review on iTunes or other podcast apps. It helps others find the show. You can connect to us. us. You can connect with us on Twitter at What the Force Show, What the Force Podcast on Facebook, or our website, whattheforce.ca, or on our new Discord. The links are in the liner notes. Feel free to reach out and start a conversation. Cheers. <laughs>